<laughs> I want to thank you very much. That's a very gracious introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a bunch of materials over here for people whenever this is over, including my card and all the information to get in touch with me. Some of you have experience with RDC. Some of you don't. Some of you have been here 24 years and have experience with the RDC over that whole time. What we're trying to do with the RDC is remember that we need to develop the culture of research here at the university. This university was founded on the idea of being a teacher's college where teachers taught teachers how to teach teachers how to teach. Research doesn't fall in there very much. And so getting the culture of research is an important part of what we're doing. And I'm very glad to be in public health, which is only one of the two colleges that has an office of research which is great and spectacular and I need to go back over to pharmacy and make sure we have one pretty soon because we still don't. But what I want to talk about today are important things that relate to getting a research development committee major grant. And so we'll go through that a little bit, a few tips about how to understand the mechanism, how to do the application, and then I'll leave a bunch of information so that you can get busy because the deadline is the end of this month. So when you look at what we're doing at the RDC, our guiding principle is to take money that the university graciously gives us every year and use this for faculty at different stages of research and scholarship. We want to review and recommend which grants are supported and advise the Vice Provost for Research on all these matters. And the Vice Provost for Research is Dr. Bill Duncan, who's a big supporter of the RDC. So what we do by doing this is use this money to help fund scholarship and research in every sense, but at the same time, we can use this funding to do things that are more than just having individuals do their work. We can work together as a committee to help develop this culture of research. And we need to do this to show that there's an appetite for research at the university, to show the president that there are a lot of people who really want to be doing this research and scholarship. The way I like to think of it for me is that the, you know, we can all go in the classroom and teach and that pays the bills and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, I don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I really want to go teach today. I wake up and say, hey, I really want to go in the lab today and do some research and scholarship. And I think most faculty members are that way. And so having an excited faculty, which is very attractive to the president, would allow having faculty members who are enthusiastic about what they're doing, and that comes from the appetite for research and scholarship. Now, it's important to remember the RDC has three grant mechanisms. I'm going to talk primarily about one today, but many of you are familiar with all three. There's our small grant mechanism where you can basically get 15, up to $1,500 in order to prove your concept. What we like to see is how one grant turns into the other, turns into the other. And so the small grants allow you to get proof of concept. The major grants up to $10,000 allow you to take that proof of concept, write it up, get successful, get that funding, and then obtain more significant results, more publications, and more proof of concept for external reviewers. And then finally, interdisciplinary grants up to $50,000, where you take several different people who maybe had major grants and put them together to form a unique interdisciplinary group that adds some new value to the university. So it's really important that all of these phases are important and essential to getting a grant. If you've had a small grant, you can turn it into a major. And part of writing a major grant is to remember to use the information that you got from your small grant to prove that you're going to be successful with the money and convince the reviewers that, hey, I did great with $1,500, I'm going to do seven times better with $10,000. When we look at the major research grants, $10,000 is intended to support and encourage research in the broadest sense. So this is sciences, which don't have a problem with public health. I also have this, all this non-science stuff for when I go to art and literature and talk to them, because we actually support all these different grants. And so all of this that's going on under the major research grants, I'm the chair of the entire RDC, and I have three very good co-chairs right now. And the co-chair who's specific for major grants is Steve Karsai, East Vaughn Karsai, who's over in biological sciences. And he's taken over and started doing a lot this year, so you can also talk to him about some of your questions. Remember, our deadline is February 28th. The money will be awarded in fiscal year 2015, which starts July 1st, 2014. So I guess that was just designed to be complicated for no real reason. But it fits with the university year. So when you're planning your grant, plan to start using it as of July. Don't try to start earlier. 
And when we look at the important part of these grants, after we talk about writing the application, it's really essential to remember the reviewers who will be reading your application. And the reviewers will come from the faculty here at ETSU. We don't pre-select reviewers. We take people who have existing grants or are members of the RDC committee, and they all come to our review sessions and review grants. So if you're writing a grant on public health, epidemiology, whatever, it may be reviewed by somebody, dare I say, from philosophy. Okay? So when you're writing for your reviewers who are not necessarily public health experts, remember when you write an RDC grant, you need to write it at a slightly different, more generalized level when you start out and then focus it down as you go through the grant. And we'll talk more about this. You'll be reviewed, your grant will be reviewed by three to four different reviewers. They will submit written reviews and give you a preliminary score. Then we will get all the reviewers together and sit around a table for four hours and talk about grants. And anybody who has a comment can get in there and talk about it. And then at that time, we'll take a final vote and come up with a score. The score on a major grant is in, developed or is, involves two different aspects of the grant. One is called the priority and one is called the merit. Now merit is something we all understand. Merit is how good is your grant, how understandable, how well can it be comprehended by a lay audience of faculty members, okay? And we often have this. People will, people will package an NSF grant and send it right in and it doesn't work really well if you're, some of your reviewers are not necessarily scientists. So you have to work at a different level in parts of the grant to explain it. But the merit is how well it's laid out, how much it's going to do, how well it's going to help bring money back to the university, and all of those aspects that we know about grants. The other side of major grants is very important for junior faculty in particular to realize is the priority score. Priority relates to your faculty status. And it's going to be very important that you talk about this in your grant and point out to the reviewer what you think your score should be. So I'm going to show you the double secret probation score review sheet, okay, and explain to you how to use the right words to explain what's important about your priority as a junior faculty member or as a senior faculty member looking for bridge funding to sustain a grant or looking for new funding to move in new directions after a record of success. Okay? I had a nice time with one department explaining that this was not ageism. Okay? We're not trying to be against senior people, but you have to explain what you're doing in order to understand this priority. And there is a higher priority for junior pre-tenure faculty members. Okay? So when you look at these, here's the double secret probation scoring guide. Okay? So when you look at this, our grants have priority and merit. And these are from 1 to 9, where 1 is great, 9 not so much. This is exactly the same scale as the NIH uses. Okay, so I claim no originality in using this scale, but the NIH uses 1 to 9 and we do too. When we look at this, the best scores are reserved for new researchers. Sorry. That's fine, that's fine. Leave them off. That's fine. So the new researchers get the lowest priority score. So this is pre-tenure faculty, people who are establishing their program, who are on their way to putting things together. The next scores are for researchers where you're doing the preliminary work that's necessary to increase your competition for external funds. So if you can prove, for example, that you've had previous funding and you need to get some more data to really get back in the pool, this is what you need to be saying. And these words are important words to include in there so that the reviewer really knows what you think you are on this scoring scale. Then here, this is my category. I'm an experienced researcher and I need bridge funds to keep my grant going. And I had a previously successful track record so I would be writing in this. And then everybody else starts to fall down here. But the important thing to remember is most of us are in these upper six. One to six. And use these words in your application when you write about why you want this grant. Now the merit descriptors, as we understand, of course, are going to be made up of how well the aims fit together, how much the budget relates to the aims, and all those other things that a grant is. But when we're writing these, when the grants are scored, there will be a priority score and a merit score. Now those two scores are not average necessarily. It's up to the reviewers to talk about which score should be given more or less weight or whether they're equal. So for example, if you're a junior faculty member and you write a great grant that's not 
that you're a junior faculty member and you write not such a great grant, there will be discussion as to whether or not to overlook a few of those errors as we get you started. But the important thing to remember is that these scores work together and you can't ignore either side of this question. So with priority, you can use some of these words here to make sure the reviewers understand where you're at and help move you onto the lower part of the scale. The rest of this is all the grantsmanship that we've ever experienced before and we know what we have to do. We have to be clear and we have to remember though, in this case we're writing for an audience that's a more generalized audience. Some of you have been on review panels and you know that some of these audiences here for the RDC reviews are a little bit more generalized than say for public health. Now if you look at what's going on with the RDC awards, the important thing with a major grant is to show and write and demonstrate that you're going to be able to take that $10,000 and turn it into an external funding application that may be successful and bring more money back to the university. And Dr. Duncan's office composited this for me. This is for fiscal years 2008 through 2010. If you look at the recipients, we had 60 recipients of major awards. Three quarters of those submitted external applications. A total of 219 applications. They were busy little bees, five apiece. And they got 34 grants funded. 52 applications are still out there. But if you look at the total direct award, six million dollars came into the university. Now this is from 46 major grants. So we have six million dollars coming in from about $600,000 that was invested. So the rate of return is on the order of $12 for every dollar the RDC gets. This is the proof we need to tell the president that the RDC is doing the right thing. And so this is really important. There was a TV show named this, not because of the RDC, but leverage. We want to show that $10,000 gets leveraged, primes the pump to bring in more external money paid back as either direct or indirect awards. And so this 12.6 is an important figure to remember. Yes? I'm kind of going with the two slides. I'm wondering how you would word um, if you are basically hoping you don't need the grant. Kind of, you, know, you have kind of grants pending, but you... Oh, well, what you would do in that case, you would... Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. So the, hi. So the question is, how would you word it if you're not necessarily sure you're going to need the grant because you have other grants pending at the same time? Yeah. Okay, this is actually, this is a good thing. Okay, and it's in the guidelines and we talk about this, is that if you get a major grant and you subsequently get one of these other applications, then you can return the major grant. So what you would say is, I need this to ensure that I will stay competitive if I get the other award, then I'll give the money back to the RDC. Okay, so you, even though that's known, you would still suggest... Yes, you go ahead and say that because, you, because what you're going to be writing about is, hey, I've got all these applications out there, I'm trying real hard, I'm busting my ass to do this stuff, and, but I need this $10,000 to be sure that I'm doing it for the right reasons. Right? You just say, look, you know, it's a competitive time, Number of grant applications continues to go up. Amount of dollars to fund it goes down. I'm not sure of any of these, but if I get one, I'll give the money right back. This happened in our college. Uh, we had a freshman member who applied for and received from the RDC front. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he got he got more funded elsewhere. Yeah. And it's happened in several colleges, and we're very fortunate, and we're actually quite glad. But we've also know that this whole thing of this bridge funding stuff, this idea that you need some money to get between application dates, because they continue to separate application dates farther and farther apart. Now, NSF is only once a year now, I think, right? And so all of a sudden, if, if you're stuck between that and you need a little bit of money to keep all the things that you've assembled and keep your reagents and keep all that stuff, bridge funding is terribly important right now. So, and I can name that, for example, one of the interdisciplinary grants went to Charlie Stewart's group. And it was very important that they had that money to keep that group together, and then they were able to get their big NIH award after it. But it was the bridge funding that kept them in the game. And we want to do that as much as possible. So, the thing that I've always found out, once I went and reviewed grants at the NIH and was on study section, is reviewers aren't nearly as smart as I gave them credit for. Okay? I was always, well, I'll write this and they'll figure it out and they know everything about everything and so I can't get away with anything. But if you don't tell them up front, if you don't show your enthusiasm and your, 
how compelled you are about doing this, the reviewers won't get that sense. Remember, they're going to be reading, oh, 10 or 20 of these. So you want to get your points across very clearly. And so it's okay to just go ahead and say it. If I get this grant, hopefully I'll get some other external funds and be able to give the money back. If I don't, it will help me bridge until the next application deadline. And just say it like that so the reviewers are very clear that you have a plan. The more your plans align in the grant with your budget and the plans for external funding and you get that across, the better your grant's going to be reviewed because people are going to say, hey, this is a guy who knows what he wants to do or she and they want to go out and get these external funds and those are the faculty members we want to keep. Okay? Just a quick follow-up, Dr. Sure. I guess, I guess, of course, sometimes we think well, that may you know, hurt the applicant because the reviewer deep down may think, well, they're going to get external funds. They're already in the game. You know, we, we'll give this money to someone else who's not there yet. Saying that's not I think that has changed. I think that used to be the RDC. Yeah, I think the RDC may have been that way at one time, but remember, I'm in charge of all these review sessions, so if I don't like what anybody's saying, I just shut them up and we get it straight, okay? <laughs> no, not quite, not quite that dictatorially, but, but no, I mean, part of, part of what Steve and I do is re remind people that it is that the whole goal is external applications. So if somebody says, well, they're going to get external money, we don't give it to them. We say, no, 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 that's not how we think about things anymore. You know, the grant is not the prize, right? The important thing is the competition. This 12.6 12, 12, uh, to 1 piece is huge. Yes. That, I mean, that is really tremendous. Yes, I take no credit for it. It's Sadie Hudson's fault, okay? <laughs> no, it, it's a tremendous thing, and it's, a, it's an unknown thing, and we need to get, I've made sure the president knows about it. But, you know, Bill Duncan did this, and you can argue, you know, there's little fudges here and there, but these dollars do come back to the university from the RDC. And as we continue to develop this review process, and part of what was happening before where people would slam people for getting external money was that the review process was flawed. As we develop a better review process and bring fresh blood and new people into the review system, we end up with a better culture of research where everybody's working on the same idea that, hey, this is all just to get external funding because that's what we want to do. And we've been very fortunate to be able to engender a lot of that. And mostly I think it's because we give you free food during the review session. But other than that. <laughs> so when we look at these recipients, we're getting this good leverage. You want to talk about that stuff in your application. There's a lot in the application. You know you have to remember your E number and you have to remember how many years you've been here and all this kind of stuff. But mostly when you're writing, you want to write compelling ideas that go along with these guidelines. That this is going to help you get tenure or this is going to be important bridge funding. This is going to keep your project going at a time when it's very difficult to compete with other people. You want to talk about your faculty status. You want to talk about how you're going to have external applications and you're going to want to talk about just where those are going. So if it says where are you going to submit your external applications, you'll say specifically, I'm going for this RFA or I'm going to this institute or I'm going to do these things. The more specific details you have about what you want to do with this money, the more it looks like to the reviewer that you actually have a plan. And having a plan is a good thing. Okay? So as we do this, the important thing to remember is if you're successful, and actually when you're successful getting your major grant, you get to, after you get your award and you do all this great work and submit all these other applications, for the next two years you get to participate in the review process. And this is something that we've instigated at my behest because it's really important to sit around the table and understand what the review process is right, like. I never knew this until I went to NIH to review. And all of a sudden, you see, A, that the, as I said, the reviewers aren't as smart as we give them credit for. B, they're sitting under a stack of paper trying to figure out which one they really like. And C, once you start doing the review yourself, you know how to write your grants for those reviewers. And that's who your audience is, right? You're not writing a paper that's going to go out to a journal. You're writing a grant that's going to go to two or three people who are going to discuss the merits of whether you should be funded. And there's a very different audience that you have to write for. And so by sitting there at the review table and listening to how many different people can come up with every different possible interpretation of what this grant is really about, you learn a lot about writing in a clear sense so that people will understand it. 
And again, the RDC review process involves a broader audience. Philosophers, art majors, all those other soft sciences, all those other things all come together. Biochemists, for God's sake, okay? So we're all there at the same table, and everybody gets a different view. And if you sit at that table, and some of you have, you can see how people write grants improperly because they don't make the point clearly to a wide audience. And so by being part of the grant review process, this gives you improved tools for your external applications. And so all of these things are going together as we try to make this really happen. Now what I wanted to talk about a little bit is a couple tips about grant writing, not too much, but the important thing that I've learned from review is that the title is really important. Because if you're a reviewer, they'll send you a select number of grants to pick from that you're going to review. And what do you read? You don't read the abstracts, you read the title. So the first impression of a grant is that title. So for example, I was working with a junior faculty member in pharmaceutical sciences who had this great title, right? A smart cure for Fraxtus, okay? Now, and I said, okay, does this tell me anything? And it doesn't. It's a very clever play on words, but if you don't know what Fraxtas are, you're not gonna do so well with this, right? So we ended up, we came up with it, correction of toxic fragile X transcripts, which is what this is all about, by transplicing, which is what that's all about. So that title gives the reviewer something to understand. What are you trying to do? What are the things you're doing it with? And stuff such as that. We can get a little too clever sometimes with our titles, right? So, you know, I used to work on dwarf mice, and I kept trying to send in grants with titles like Of Mice and Men. Not so good. Great for John Steinbeck, not so good for me. Another example, and this is a, another major grant, C-reactive protein-based treatment of pneumococcal infection. That's a pretty good title, but we actually worked together I work with Dr. Agrawal and fix this to modify natural defense mechanisms to control pneumonia. And that has real grab to it because that is accessible to everybody, okay? You got to know what C-reactive protein is to understand this, but here everybody says, oh, I'd like to do that. It doesn't matter whether you're a lay person or a scientist. You say, yes, I'd like to control pneumonia. And so your title can really matter. And again, with our more generalized audience for the RDC grant, a more generalized title is usually better. So that people really read the title and say, wow, I'd like to learn how they're going to do that. Once you get the reviewer to feel like they want to look at it, you've already got them on your side because they're not going, man, I really don't want to read this grant. I know it's going to be horrible, okay? And somebody was telling me one time there are two types of grants. And the worst kind are the ones that are called tequila grants, okay? So the reviewers get all their grants, and they put them in a pile, and they read the abstracts. And some go over here that they're going to be reading good, and the others go over here, and they're going to have a shot of tequila before they read this grant, okay? You don't want to be in that pile, okay? Remember, reviewers are just like all of us. No time, too much to do, don't want to pay attention to anything, want to do something that's easy. Make your grant easily accessible. Make your grant clear. I'm going to do this and this and this, and here are three paragraphs explaining it, and here are three items in the budget that relate to those things. When you start making it clear like that, the reviewers go, hey, I like this guy. I don't understand it, but it's clear, so I like it, you know? And so when you look at this stuff, being a reviewer is an important learning process for how you have to understand your audience when you write a grant. If you have a nice, easily readable application, this helps the reviewer as well. Getting that eight point font so everything fits, and you can't do this on our online form, so we won't talk about that. But anyway, you want to make it easy to read, and you want to make it look like it's organized. You've got aims, and the aims are in order, and they follow from each other, so the ideas should follow from each other in the application. You can use graphics. With our online form, you can submit graphics if you have a nice chart. We've talked about this before. If you have a good table that demonstrates something, you can put that in as an attachment on the online form. It's important to show people that you understand how to make this look good. And a good graphic and a couple good figures can really help sell the audience that you're doing the right thing. Look at every paragraph. A lot of people will scan your application and read the first sentence in each paragraph. 
If that's not a catchy sentence, are they going to read the rest of the paragraph? No. And that's why you want to make sure that the first sentence is a good part of your paragraph. Okay? Use words that are in the guidelines. So when you talk about bridge funding, that's in the guidelines. And that helps the reviewer understand that you've read the guidelines and you know where you are on that and this is what you want to do. And then remember, follow the outline that you made so that the organization of the outline shows up in the writing. Okay? And this is the hard one because we're all tired of making outlines and we want to just write from beginning to end and get done. So when we look at all these things, everything you do that makes this easier to read, easier to comprehend, makes it a more compelling application. And this is, yes? I just noticed um, in years past, bulleting and... Yeah, you're not going to be able to do so much of that. Yes, yeah, so online you can do that pretty easily? I think you can still add bullets, but you'd have, it won't, the word won't, word stuff may not paste in exactly the way you want it. Okay? But again, if you really need to do it, you can put stuff in as an attachment at the end. Like, it, let's say you want to put a table of contents in there, you could do that as an attachment. Okay? So when you, when you look at what you're trying to do, this is not just an exercise in window dressing. We talk a lot about grants personmanship, you know, it's like, oh, we've got to be careful how we write so it looks the right way so it doesn't get any red flags. But this idea of being clear helps you understand how clear your idea is and how compelling your idea is. And this is always valuable because you want an idea that has legs that's going to keep going and make things happen. So if you keep looking at all these things, they're all focused on the clarity behind your ideas. So no matter how nice you make it, if you don't have the right ideas, it's not going to go so far. So you got to follow the guidelines. You got to get the guidelines. They're over there. You got to read them. That I can't help you with. You got to respond. You got to make sure you understand. So if the guidelines say these are, you know, there's priority and merit, you got to talk about both of those in your application so that those scores are very clear to the reviewer. Look at the topics. Everything's in order. We even have a text template this year that you can use in Word to get everything ready to paste into the application. So we've got a lot of things that will help you with all these topics and getting everything in order. And mostly what you want to look for is if you see a word in the guidelines that really appeals to you that says, you know, I'm filling this niche, use that word from the guidelines in your application. Convince the reviewer that you're made for the guidelines, that the guidelines were made to fund your application, and then you'll be on the right side. Remember, somebody had this, I stole this from another slide from another grantsmanship talk, but this is what reviewers look like, except now it's that we have these giant hard drives filled up with we don't have paper anymore, we just have PDFs out the wazoo, okay? So this is what the guys are redoing when we review. You may have 20 grants you have to look at. You need to make it easy to read. You need to make it easy for the reviewer to access the contents. You need to have a reviewer that's going to be able to read it and become your advocate. They're going to read it, they're going to say, this is from a junior person who's really thought about what they're doing and it's a very compelling idea. If you can get your reviewer to start thinking that way about your application, then when they sit around the review table and some snide guy from hoity-toity university says, oh, this isn't so good, that reviewer is going to say, hey, look, no, this is this good because you're going to give them the information to answer all those criticisms. So when the reviewer reads this and starts thinking about this as a compelling problem that they want to support, that reviewer becomes your advocate at the meeting and then you've won a lot of the contest. Okay? So by doing this, you're giving them statements that answer questions, things that are going to make sure that they know that you've thought about how to troubleshoot, what am I going to do if this goes sideways, why is it that AIM-1 or AIM-2 is not dependent on AIM-1, stuff like that, all that basic stuff. But if you've thought about this and given real clear reasons for this stuff, you may be able to have a reviewer that says, I really like this application and I think it should get funded. At which point I'll tell them to quit using the F word. But anyway, people want to see you get this application to become successful. And this greater chance of success is what we're all after. Okay? So when you write this stuff, again, how many times have I said this now? Six? You've sat through this lecture before in the fall anyway, so now it's 48 times for you. So guidelines. Look at the stupid guidelines and use the words in the guidelines. Okay? 
I even put a lot of them in big, bold color this year, okay? And you can download the PDF from the website. Take the time to get this done ahead of time and share the draft with somebody else. Take your courage in your hand and hand your precious grant to somebody else who's going to say, I just don't get this part that you wrote. You, oh, but that's the best part. And then you have to figure out how to explain it. So remember, criticism is good. Criticism before review helps you avoid criticism during review. And that's what we all want. Yes? Find the mean reviewers. Don't find the nice reviewers. Find the people that are willing to rip you. So there you go. Find people. Oh, yeah, this is and I, I've told many people here, and I'll tell everybody, email it to me at some point. I'll read it over as fast as I can. I've gotten really good at reading major grant applications in the past few years, and I will get you some comments back, okay? I may not be the meanest reviewer, but <laughs> I'll make sure the title works. <laughs> Use these guidelines. Make sure you understand how you fit in the guidelines. If it looks like it's not in your favor, try to figure out another way to state it. If you're not a pre-tenure faculty member, it doesn't mean you're not going to get a major grant. You just have to work a little harder to convince the reviewer that you're as good as anybody else and you deserve this. Okay? Ask your favorite RDC chairperson if you can ad hoc at a review session. If you really want to understand the process, as they say, go see how the sausage is being made. Okay? And so ask me and you can sit in on the review session to understand what the deal is. The important thing about all of these things is you're working hard to make sure it's right. Okay? Now, if you look at the RDC over here in the College of Public Health, Dr. Anyango is one of your representatives, and the other I don't know, or we don't have one yet, and that's my fault. But we have two representatives from every college. Oh, oh, sorry, yes, Arsham, okay. So there you go. So Arsham has now volunteered to read your draft. <laughs> you, you were at review, right? You've been at a review session, right, Arsham? Yes, yes. You've been at review, and Jonathan, you were at review. Anybody else? Yeah. You were at review. Have you been at review in the past few years? Yeah, I mean, not the major one, I guess. Not the, not the ones where we actually all sat around the table, right? Yeah. No, and so the reviews changed a little bit from them, and these two guys know about it. And so if you get the, you know, what we want you to remember is all these people are here to help you. Okay, you have your colleagues and collaborators, but the RDC members as well. We're here to help you. Send it to me. I'll send you something back as fast as I can. Things get a little hectic on February 27th, so let's try to beat that deadline, okay? But we can still get something. I can still help you a little bit. But the important thing is, if you're sending it out to get reviewed before you submit it, some of those holes that you would normally fall into will be avoided. And you have to look at it as you're just trying to get the reviewers to go far enough down the path that they feel like it's the right grant before you fall into a hole, okay? So all these people are part of this. All these people will be part of the review in some way, as well as all previous grantees for the past two years. So everybody, yes? Uh, well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Uh, so these, this, this uh, makeup is not really proportionate to the student or faculty size. Correct. Uh, and I guess that's just an observation. I guess the question is, um, uh, I guess it's fairly obvious. You must refuse yourself. Yes, if you if they're from your college, you're asked to recuse yourself from review. Okay, or if you feel like, uh, or for example, if like if I was if there was a grant that came in from somebody I collaborate with on my work, I would recuse myself from that as well. Okay, so yes, it's actually as I've said to some people, it's kind of incestuous at certain points, but we try to keep it all as above board as possible. Yes? Yeah, what if uh, somebody on the committee is also an applicant? Somebody on the committee, what? He's also an applicant. Also, that's fine. Okay. They, we would have them, re we would probably review their application at the, at the different meeting. We try to have two meetings, one on each campus. So that person's application would certainly be reviewed at the meeting they're not at. Okay. And again, Although I can be heavy handed about it, if somebody was obviously voting in a certain way to get rid of everybody else so their application was scored better, I would be able to see that in the score sheets. I don't think anybody's quite that venal here, 
okay? But, you know, I'm sure that people worry about that at NIH and stuff like that. But no, we, we try to do everything as much as possible to ask people to recuse themselves if they feel like any perception of conflict. Okay, so we'll start the meeting by talking about that. And then a lot of people will take great pains to make sure they're not doing anything improper. Okay? Is that, is that a good answer? Yeah. You okay with that? Good. No, I mean, we really want this to work, but if we're going to have faculty review other faculty's grants, then there's always going to be a little bit of that crosstalk, and we have to watch out for it. And to your point, I mean, this was set up, this is set up in the faculty handbook that there's two from each college and three from the others, okay? And so, I mean, pharmacy is the worst. There's like two of us, and there's like nine basic science members, you know? But that's okay. I guess that's why I'm doing all this work. So, well, we have a lot, and we have a lot of good representatives, and we we don't apply anything to a grant. So, when we get X number of grants submitted, we'll just take them in the order that they come in and start assigning them to people. We're not going to try to take biochemists to do biochemistry grants or public health people to do epidemiology grants. We don't try to do it that way. We ask the reviewers if, if they don't feel competent. If they have real trouble with that, we ask them to let me know and we try to get somebody else. But most times people do a very good job. And you would be surprised at how well somebody who doesn't do your work can figure out whether or not it makes sense to them. And I think this is the most valuable exercise for both the grantee and the reviewer. Because it helps spread the idea of what people are doing around the university better. But it also teaches the grantee that you have to write for a more general audience. If you can write in a way that makes sense to a philosopher, I'm picking on philosophers today, but if you can write in a way that makes sense to a philosopher, then somebody on your study section is really going to be able to pick up on it. Yeah, and that, that's really critical because we think of the study sections as being kind of all very similar, but I know at NCI, oh, no. physicians down to uh, social workers. I mean, we got this huge, broad range of people sitting on that study section. Yeah, and you know this. I mean, once you go to study section, you start finding out. I, I, was a, I was on a fellowship study section that dealt just with training grants. So we weren't really dealing with all these research questions. We were dealing with, you know, student qualifications and, and the big institutional training grants, the T32s. And it was amazing because the places that really wanted to keep those big training grants that had had them for 30, 40, 50 years, Gee, it was funny because every uh, about a year before their grant was due, they would ad hoc on the study section. They wanted to see what the talk was about. They wanted to see what people were looking at. And that's fair. You know, they're playing the game really well, but it's okay. And so you want to look at what the study section is doing. You want to understand that dynamic. There's a great video on the web at... NIDDK. Yeah. Yeah, there's a study section video on the web where they show a mock study section and some of the dynamics that go on. And until you actually see this happen, until you see somebody who's fallen asleep because they couldn't read everything trying to explain something to somebody else, you don't really get the real picture of study section. Yeah. It's yeah, it's at NCRR at the Research Resources Place or the what's the CSR? I'm sorry, Center for Scientific Review, which is you, you type study section, yeah, yeah, mock study section review video or something, and it's really informative. And then to actually do it in person, which is what we're doing with everybody at the RDC, it really becomes even that much clearer. Okay? So I could go on forever, and I already have, but the important thing is you'll think of something as soon as I get back over on another campus where parking is easier and all that stuff. You'll think of something. So email me. My email's on my card. If you really want to, my cell phone number's on my card. Just call me. But we'll get this straight, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Now over here, I have a couple things. I have a couple copies of the guidelines. That's okay. Yeah, let's turn that on for a second. So I have some copies of the guidelines that I'm going to give to a couple people. And these are all posted on the website. I'll show you in a minute. Now, here's, why don't you hold on to that because you're going to submit. Here's a copy of what the application's looking like. Here's a copy of the budget template. That's for Becky. <laughs> And then here's copies of the slides to pass around for everybody, okay? And my card. You already have my card, but I'll give you another one. <laughs> uh, they're staying up nights making my cards right now. So, when we look at what's going on, I want to take a second. I'm going to go over to the web and show you the RDC website. 
Does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, so the if you go to the ETSU website and you look for research and the research development committee. Oh, they oh great, the link's broken. Okay. <laughs> Here, let's try this one. Research Development Committee. Okay, here you go. So, so this is the, the central page for the website. It has uh, Richard Cordham does work in Mongolia, so they took a nice picture of a Mongolian rock. So that's what he does. And so here's the home page. And now over here, which of course you can't see because of the stupid add-on things, is the three sets. Small grants, major grants, interdisciplinary grants. So I'm going to go major grants. Major grant home, okay? And so what we have here is information about the current situation, deadlines, amounts, all this stuff, and then the important stuff is right here. So we have every document you need is posted on the website. So we have guideline, oops, guidelines, which is that, well, it's a couple clicks away. It's a big PDF document that explains everything you need to know. Except, there we go. Okay, see? And I came up, I made this, instead of doing the work I was supposed to do in January, I made this little logo, okay? So it's now everywhere that I can find. Okay, but anyway, the guidelines have all this information again, all hopefully organized so that you can figure out what to do. Everybody's available to help you with your preparation, okay? It's essential to increase funding by showing how your proposal will do this, how you will get external funding. A lot of these things, trying to make it as straightforward as possible. How to be eligible, how to access the forms. To get to the forms, you go to the major website. I'm going to close this for a minute here. Uh, oops. I hate PCs, I'm sorry. Okay. So we're going to go back. We're going to go back. We're going to go back to the major grant program home. Okay, so we saw the guidelines. There's also instructions, which are a lot like the guidelines, because I made both documents the same this year. Then we have the application, okay? Now the application package, okay? So we have uh, several different things here. We'll see this in a minute. We have an online form for the application. We also have a Word template where you can put all the text and develop that before you go online so you can cut and paste. We have an Excel template for the budget where I've locked the cells so that hopefully everything will calculate correctly. Okay? And these two are downloadable from this site. And then we also have, there's the online formers right here. So they also give you a preview of it in PDF format. But if you finally, when you're ready to go online, you click on this online link here and you go to the Adobe website and the grant form comes up okay yeah it's everywhere I'm telling you it's everywhere because they see that they're gonna shut down logo making so I decided to do it now before they shut it down so when you look at it here's the online form you may save this form so you can work on it save it and come back to it it's all online. At the end, before you hit the submit button, and you will know this because you read the guidelines, before you submit it, you have to print it in order to do the routing, the signatures. Okay? But all of this is explained in the guidelines. The important thing is there's 10 sections to this form. This top information is stuff that the reviewers need to see rapidly. What's your name? Where's your college? We have all these drop down things as much as possible, right? So public health, we start filling in the form, okay? Title of the project, everything with a red asterisk is required. So you're gonna say, I need $10,000. Date of submission, this is just when you finally click to submit it and all that stuff. 
So all this stuff is just like any other online form. So you start typing your name and you can tab around and all this good stuff. All that kind of stuff. That's a really clean form there. Well, Steve Carsai built this form. It's very good and he did a great job. And you can actually, so pharmacy, farms. No, that's not my e-number at all. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> but you start filling all this stuff in, and the forms are tailored towards the reviewer. So we have a couple questions. How long have you been in your current position? This is, we need to know how long you've been at ETSU. When did you begin? Okay, so if you began in 1970, but you became a full professor two years ago, you would have different numbers here and all this stuff. The important thing is fill all this in, and as you go through the form, we'll keep going along. Sorry, I'm turning the mouse around. Right. So if you have a co-investigator on a major grant, you may have one co-investigator. In all, in every, in this round of submission, you may be a PI on one grant and a co-I on one other grant, and that's the limitation, okay? So choose your co-investigators wisely, okay? But the co-investigator, you fill this information out as well. Then we get to the narrative section. So you have these boxes, you may have to scroll a little bit, but you type the text in, project titles, right? As I said, of mice and men, all this kind of stuff. And so you can go through this, and the character limits are here. And notice that there's also even help that tells you a little bit about what's supposed to go in each space. And we have these question marks as well. So there's online help that's basically the same thing as in the guidelines. Okay? Somebody once said, I really like to give instructions to people, and so I do it as many ways as possible. So we have help question marks and help hovers and all this stuff. But each of these boxes will fill up to your text. So you have the abstract, that's the overall description. The project benefits. How is this going to help the university? This is where you're going to say stuff like external funding applications. Okay, notoriety for the university. Publications with the university's name on it, stuff like that. Project description. Now that you've got the reviewers all frothing at the mouth to fund you, you got to tell them what you're actually going to do. This is the easy part. Okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this, these three things. And I'm going to have these specific aims. And in order to do the aims, I'm going to do it with this design and methods. Notice that as you go through this list, in the abstract, you want to write for that more lay general audience. Then as you get to description and aims, you can begin to focus and write more as if you were writing a grant that went to a public health agency. Because you want to show that you are practice in what you know how to do. But you've explained the big picture, then you get down to the nitty gritty, okay? So these forms go along. So the section four is where all the text is going. <coughs> Significance, again, you'll mention, hey, I need this for bridge funding. Hey, I'm a junior faculty member and this is gonna help my, make my career at ETSU. All those kind of significant things. Career aims, oh, I really want to be the best in the world at epidemiology here at ETSU. And that's where you write that kind of stuff. And that's a little bit new section, right? Can you think? We changed the name slightly because people didn't understand that that's what we wanted there. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't perfect. It's never going to be perfect, but it's getting better, okay? And then finally in the literature cited, put your citations in the text, when you're, you know, when you're pointing out in the abstract that you've written a paper on this, make sure that publication shows up. So you make citations in the text and then give the references in the literature cited, okay? Then we go down a couple of little additional things. Here's the box where you say, I give up my life and will serve you faithfully for the next two years, Dr. Hurley. And stuff like that as a reviewer. <laughs> yeah, bring me pizzas and coffee and all that stuff. And then we also get down into all these uh, special approvals. Uh, many of us in this crowd will have this or this, human subjects or animal use, maybe some others, international travel. You may apply for your grant without having the special approval already completed. But you will have to have those completed before you can get the award money opened up to you. This is always a big deal. Right, so IRB approval, many of us have heard all those stories about it. But the important thing to remember is, all you have to do is check the ones that apply. 
If you already have approval, you can include that, but this isn't required. Okay, approval is not a required during submission. It's required if you get the grant. Okay, and then we get to the budget part, and there's a, uh, we even link. So, for example, this link goes to that Excel template. So while you're online, you can download the template yet again to fill out the budget. And the budget template is lined up exactly with all these categories. So all you have to do is after you type them into Excel correctly, you have to type them into the sheet correctly. And I couldn't figure out how to make that any easier, but I will work on that. Okay? And so then you have budget justification. So there are four different sections. There's personnel operating expenses and supplies, travel, and equipment. Most of you will not write for equipment, so you don't have to fill that out. But the justification here, each section is justified. So why do you need $2,500 for a summer stipend? That kind of stuff. Explain where your budget figures come from. Why, you know, what are your, what's your $5,000 for supplies? Well, it's $3,000 for rats, $2,000 for mice, and per diem and all that stuff, okay? Simple, effective justification usually works well, okay? You guys know this, how to justify a budget, right? Because Becky writes herd over you guys with a whip, right? <laughs> so, and then we get, then at this point in section seven, instead of all those long forms that we used to have that were really complicated and turned sideways and all this stuff, you now are going to be pasting in your CVs as an attachment. So you can make your CV two or three pages, make it look exactly the way you want it, click this button, and you will attach that file to the application. Okay, so your CV is going to look the way you want it, and you can do that for yourself and for your co-investigator. Then you have some headings here relating to other funding that you have. And this list of headings, you copy the headings, they're on the text template as well, and then you just fill them in for every grant that you have instead of that stupid table that we used to have. Okay, and you'll be pasting that in in boxes 7A through D. Sorry about the clumsy nomenclature. So you, the PI will paste in their funding history, prior RDC funding, these are a little bit overlap, but we like to have this separate as well. And then for the COI if necessary. And then finally we get to, if you want to put a really good graphic in there, you can put up to three different files with a combined size of 15 megabytes. That's pretty big. So you can put some good files in there, some really good information that shows people exactly what you want to do. If you say, I need to do this analysis. We're going to have people in other places that may even include uh, audio files or specialized graphics files or even computer files that demonstrate stuff because we can attach a lot of different file types here. Okay? And this is a lot, hopefully, and some of you filled out the old forms, I think this is a little bit more straightforward than the old forms. It's all online, then there comes the big disclaimer that you have to click and sign and with, by typing your name, which says again that you will bring me pizza and coffee whenever I want it and all that stuff, okay? Then at the bottom, <coughs> number 10, this is the part that you have to print for. You're gonna print the whole application before you hit the submit button, okay? And because you have to then sign it yourself, have your chair sign it and your dean sign it before it's official. If you have a co-investigator, the same three signatures are needed. And we all know this from routing grants previously, but we had to do it. I just want to make sure everybody understands. So when you get to the bottom of the form, at the end of the application, the save button is over here. Okay, so if you're working on the form and you get really tired or you realize you do need more pizza and coffee, you can hit the save button and what it will do is say it's saved and it sends you a link to your email address. And then when you open your email, you click on that link and you'll go back to the form the way it was when you quit. Okay? So it's a little bit odd that way, but it sends you that special email link. And that will be good through the entire time. So you could start today, come back to it any time up through February 28th. Now when you've got it all done, you'll be clicking on the submit button. But before you click on the submit button, you have to print it. And that's from your browser print menu up there. Because you have to have a paper copy. 
because apparently Adobe doesn't think anybody wants access to their form after they click the submit button. It will disappear. It will go to me and then you'll have to call and beg me and bring me more pizza and coffee and then we'll print it out for you. But what you want to do, and it's all explained here, and even in red, okay, is you just have to be careful. So you hit, you get it all ready, you print it, then when you click submit, if everything's right, it will go right away and you'll get a receipt, notification, all that. If there's something that's not filled out the way it's supposed to be, it will tell you that and you go fix it. So that's the only tricky part of this. I think it's a great step forward for us. If you find something that doesn't make sense to you, let me know. Okay? So I've already gotten word from people, oh, I need more characters in literature cited. And fine, we can fix that. Because we can fix this form online while it's still active. So we won't have to call everybody back. Okay? So I think this is a great step forward for us, and it's really going to be useful. Yes? So we bring the paper copy to no. No, you follow the instructions. Okay? <laughs> Both the electronic and signed paper copies are due at fourth floor Ross Hall, the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. The signature, the whole thing with the signature, so it's the last page, goes to Office of Research. Right, that's not my office. Uh, sorry, that's okay. <laughs> I wish it was my office. I need staff, you know? But anyway. No. Fourth floor Ross Hall. Friday the 28th by 4.30 p.m. And it's really simple. We've got Word templates, Excel templates. If I can think of another template, I'm going to put it out there, okay? Because I want everybody to feel like the forms are working for them. The real beauty of these forms, the other side, is that in terms of keeping track of what's going on, all the analysis gets done online for us. I don't have to get an Excel spreadsheet and count up how many people are from public health. This, this whole site gives me those numbers and updates it automatically as the forms come in. So that's a real advantage for us too. And it helps us get more proof for the president to say that there's an appetite for research here. And this is really good stuff. I mean, NIH online forms are not this easy. Okay, NSF, yes, and I wrote to NSF and said, please give me a copy of Fastlane, and they never answered my request. So, <laughs> anyway, anybody have any specific questions? I hate to go over like this, but I, I get very excited about it. Well, after your introduction, I'm all charged up now. Somebody's actually paying attention. We are trying this stuff, and it's working. And after Joel's kind words as well, we're doing good stuff, and it's really making a difference. Yes? Yes? Uh, it's essentially the same for interdisciplinary, except that you have to you have more co-investigator slots. You have a couple extra boxes to fill out in terms of why it's interdisciplinary and what it will add. It's all online. If you go to the interdisciplinary site on the RDC site, you'll see all those same things. Guidelines, which are basically the same except for a few differences. Now, interdisciplinary program, you can also write for a symposium, and that's a whole separate form, but we've taken that out of the form this year. Okay? And now, I encourage you, I encourage people to think about interdisciplinary, but to remember that only one will get funded every year. So the competition is very stringent there. Major grants, approximately 20 will get funded. Much better odds. Okay? And so, you know, think about what you're doing. If you want to do some real good interdisciplinary stuff, then grab one other co-investigator out of it and write it as a major grant. Get the data and then go for the interdisciplinary grant. Okay? And I see some heads nodding here. So, yes, we've all experienced this. $50,000, it sounds so great, but that's why everybody always writes those things. Okay? If you have a major, you're not eligible in the next year. But then you can have two majors in a five-year period. Okay? So if you're a brand new faculty, you get a major your first year, then you still have one more before your tenure. Okay? And again, we'll check all the, you know, we try to check all this, but again, if you, if you have any questions about any specifics of guidelines, just send me an email and we'll get you an answer. Or read the guidelines. But anyway. It's, we I'm really proud of this. Steve Carside did this form. It's terrific. 
it's much better than I ever thought. And then I made that nice logo, so how, how else could I improve it, right? So anyway, I'm really glad everybody got to listen. And like I keep saying, if you have any questions, just let me know by email. My cards are here and all that stuff, okay? Anything else? Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.